Welcome back to 60 Minutes. Susan Neil Fraser is tonight behind bars. A mother, a grandmother, convicted of murdering her partner, Bob Chappell. Convicted by a jury of her peers, sentenced to 23 years. But there's one problem. Dr. Bob Chappell a 65-year-old chief radiation physicist at the Royal Hobart Hospital, was eagerly anticipating his retirement, dreaming of sailing around Australia on his yacht. Bob and his partner of 18 years, Sue Neil Fraser, had a close-knit, blended family with grown children from previous marriages. In September 2008, they found their ideal yacht, the Four Winds in Brisbane. Requiring renovation, Bob eagerly undertook the project, deeply involving himself in every aspect of the yacht. In January 2009, the yacht arrived in Hobart, moored in the River Derwent at Sandy Bay. The yacht represented their shared dreams and aspirations. On Australia Day 2009, Bob and Sue spent the day working on the yacht. After lunch, Sue returned home, leaving Bob to stay overnight on the vessel. That evening, Sue received a troubling phone call from a friend of Bob's daughter, Claire, who suffered from mental illness. The friend shared Claire's disturbing premonition about Bob, leaving Sue worried. Later, passers-by noticed the four winds half-submerged in Sandy Bay. Approaching the yacht, they found it deserted with no sign of Bob. This discovery marked the beginning of a mysterious and unsettling case involving Bob Chappell's disappearance. On the morning of January 26, 2009, as dawn broke over Sandy Bay at 5.40 a.m., a peculiar sight caught the attention of two friends near the Sandy Bay Rowing Club. An inflatable dinghy lay abandoned, washed up on the rocky shore. Curiosity peaked, they approached for a closer inspection, finding no sign of its owner. As they scanned the bay, a disturbing sight unfolded. A yacht, partially submerged, a stone's throw from the shoreline, Acting swiftly, the friends secured the dinghy and ventured out on their own boat, racing towards the stricken vessel to offer assistance. As they boarded the half-sunken yacht, known as the Four Winds, a chilling silence greeted them. They shouted, searching for any signs of life, but it was clear the yacht was deserted. In the saloon, ominous dark spots, possibly blood, added to the eerie atmosphere. Realizing the gravity of the situation, they promptly alerted the authorities. By 7.30 a.m., police officers had descended upon the scene. They worked diligently to pump out water and prevent the yacht from sinking completely. Their initial assessment pointed towards a deliberate act of sabotage a cut pipe connected to the toilet and an open seacock hidden beneath a carpeted panel indicated a calculated effort to scuttle the vessel. Despite the efforts of two police boats and a team of four divers, there was no trace of the yacht's owner, Bob Chappell, 
or his personal effects in the surrounding waters. The initial search of the Four Winds was frenetic. While part of the team focused on saving the yacht from sinking, others meticulously processed the scene for clues. The yacht's layout deck, wheelhouse and saloon became the focus of a meticulous examination. Photos from this initial search revealed a knife on the wheelhouse floor and blood on the steps leading into the saloon, where a bloody torch and a section of missing carpet tiles added to the ominous findings. Sue Neil Fraser, co-owner of the yacht and Bob's partner, was quickly contacted by the police. Shocked by the news of the yacht's dire state and Bob's disappearance, she rushed to the scene with her daughters and Bob's son, Tim. Aboard the yacht, Sue pointed out several anomalies. A missing personal beacon, an unmounted fire extinguisher, and misplaced items, suggesting a disturbance. Visibly shaken and struggling to process the scene, possibly tainted with Bob's blood, Sue provided the police with a basic timeline of her last interaction with Bob. She was too distressed for a formal interview, but mentioned leaving the dinghy at the Royal Yacht Club, puzzled as to how it ended up on the rocks. The police secured the dinghy and conducted a thorough examination, including a luminal test, which revealed significant blood evidence. This discovery indicated a violent occurrence leading them to rule out suicide, given Bob's seemingly content life and excitement for retirement. Insurance fraud was also considered but dismissed after discussions with Bob's friends and family confirmed his enthusiasm and financial capability for the yacht renovation. As night fell and the new day dawned, Bob Chapel remained missing. Sue Neil Fraser, Bob's partner, agreed to a formal police interview, her account raising more questions than answers. She recounted her activities after leaving the dinghy at the Royal Yacht Club, describing an unusually long visit to Bunnings Warehouse. She lingered for hours, possibly four to five, aimlessly wandering the aisles without making a purchase. Her guilt over not having her phone compounded her worry for Bob, yet she chose not to return home. Sue's recollection of her evening was vague. She couldn't pinpoint her arrival time at home, only that it was nearing dusk and that Bob hadn't tried to contact her. Several phone calls from friends and family punctuated her evening, the last from Richard King, ending around 10.30 p.m., as confirmed by phone records. After this call, she went to bed, only to be awakened the next morning by the shocking news of the sinking yacht and Bob's disappearance. Three days after Bob was last seen, a crucial piece of evidence emerged. The missing beacon from the Four Winds was discovered on the rocks at Rest Point Foreshore, under a kilometre from the Yacht Club. Its inlet valve was broken, suggesting foul play. The yacht was subsequently removed for forensic analysis, revealing the DNA of an unknown female on the starboard walkway. This finding puzzled investigators. The DNA didn't match Sue, her daughters, or their friends, leading to speculation that it might have been present before Bob and Sue acquired the yacht. Inspector Powell's team, working tirelessly, hit a dead end. Public appeals for information brought forward witnesses who reported seeing a grey aluminum dinghy attached to the four winds, contrasting with the inflatable blue and white one owned by Bob and Sue. Sue's narrative raised suspicions. Her familiarity with the yacht's layout suggested intimate knowledge, crucial in understanding how the seacock, hidden under a panel and carpet, 
was opened. Additionally, a red jacket found on Margaret Street, between the Royal Yacht Club and where the dinghy was discovered, initially denied by Sue, but later identified by her daughters as hers, added to the mystery. CCTV footage from Bunnings Warehouse contradicted Sue's claim of spending hours there on Australia Day. In a subsequent interview, Sue amended her story, adjusting her arrival and departure times and her purpose at the store. Yet another interview saw her altering her story again, now uncertain if her Bunnings visit even occurred on that day. A week later, inconsistencies in Sue's account continued to surface. Interviews with ABC journalist Felicity Ogilvie contradicted her initial statements. Sue mentioned driving to Marieville Esplanade to check on the yacht, something she hadn't disclosed to investigators. This nocturnal visit, prompted by a disturbing call from Richard King, who cared for Claire, Bob's mentally ill daughter, further complicated her narrative. In April 2009, an extensive sonar search in Sandy Bay waters yielded no connection to Bob. Sue's statement evolved once more in May, admitting to confusion over her activities on Australia Day. Her inability to recall key details, such as whether it was light or dark when she returned home or where she parked her car, added to the growing cloud of doubt. Bob's sister, Anne, informed the police of Sue's admission about driving to Maryville Esplanade after speaking with King, a detail Sue later corrected, claiming she walked instead. Her final statement conceded her worry for Bob prompted this visit, but finding the yacht seemingly undisturbed, she assumed he was asleep on board. During their investigation into Bob Chappell's disappearance and presumed murder, police grew increasingly suspicious of Sue Neil Fraser. Examining Bob and Sue's relationship, they noted both had children from previous marriages and Sue's continued passion for equestrian activities. A significant strain in Bob's life was his troubled relationship with his daughter Claire, who struggled with mental health issues and once threatened self-harm if Bob didn't leave Sue. The police, gathering evidence, tapped Sue's phone and collected over 700 hours of conversations. By August 2009, Sue was arrested based on circumstantial evidence, despite her network's shock and belief in her innocence. A key twist came in March 2010, when DNA found on the yacht matched Megan Vass, a homeless 15-year-old. Despite her denial of involvement and gaps in her memory due to substance abuse, this DNA link couldn't be ignored. However, her testimony at Sue's trial wasn't further pursued, even with new information about her whereabouts on the night of the incident. Sue's defense highlighted the lack of direct evidence and pointed out investigative oversights. In contrast, the prosecution argued that Sue, familiar with the yacht, murdered Bob for financial gain, suggesting she disposed of his body at sea. This theory was bolstered by Philip Triffitt's claims that Sue had previously expressed a desire to kill Bob, a claim Sue denied. Justice Blow concluded the murder was intentional and financially motivated. On October 15, 2010, Sue was sentenced to 23 years in prison, but maintained her innocence, with her supporters continuing to challenge the verdict. Since most vehemently. Neil Fraser has been jailed for 26 years for murdering her long-term partner Bob Chappell on Australia Day last year. 
The radiation physicist was attacked on board the couple's yacht. His body weighted down with a fire extinguisher and dumped in the depths of the River Derwent. It's the first Tasmanian case where a murder conviction has been secured without a body being found. In 2011, Sue Neill Fraser, steadfast in her quest for justice, appealed her conviction. Central to her appeal was the mysterious presence of Megan Vass on the yacht, suggesting she could have either committed the murder or witnessed it. Sue's defense also presented an alternative theory, that Bob was a victim of a burglary gone wrong. Despite the court rejecting the appeal and maintaining her guilt, her sentence was reduced to 23 years with a non-parole period of 13 years. Sue's supporters worked tirelessly to prove her innocence, but their efforts were marred by incidents that undermined their cause. Notably, three people were charged with crimes related to presenting false evidence, including solicitor Jeffrey Thompson and Stephen Gleason, a homeless man who claimed to have seen Vass near the yacht. Eve Ash and Colin McLaren emerged as Sue's most compelling advocates. Ash's documentary series, Undercurrent, co-produced with former detective McLaren, sought to unravel the truth behind Bob Chappell's disappearance. They interviewed Sue's family and friends, who unanimously expressed disbelief in her capacity for murder. This sentiment was echoed by those who knew both Sue and Bob, countering claims that Sue had once plotted to kill Bob. Inconsistencies in Sue's statements, particularly her failure to mention her late-night visit to Mariville Esplanade, were scrutinized. Sarah, Sue's daughter, attributed these inconsistencies to the shock and stress Sue experienced upon learning of Bob's disappearance. She highlighted the sensitive nature of Claire's mental illness and Sue's attempt to protect the family's reputation, which inadvertently cast suspicion on her. Further complicating the investigation were discrepancies in evidence, such as the ATM footage of a car resembling Sue and Bob's and the untested long dark hair found on a discarded red jacket, allegedly belonging to Sue. This evidence, combined with Sue's fluctuating accounts of her activities, particularly regarding her visit to Bunnings Warehouse and her handling of stress, painted a picture of confusion rather than premeditated guilt. Ash's discovery of untested DNA on the jacket and McLaren's analysis of the crime scene photos revealed overlooked details, suggesting alternative scenarios. The presence of coins and biological traces near the yacht's hatch indicated a struggle or movement, not initially considered by the investigators. The possibility that the Four Winds was involved in smuggling operations prior to Sue and Bob's ownership was a theory overlooked by investigators. This line of inquiry gained traction after subsequent drug busts at Scarborough Marina, where the yacht had been previously moored. The case against Sue Neil Fraser was mired in complex, sometimes contradictory evidence. Her supporters, including legal experts like QC Robert Richter, criticised the investigation and trial processes, suggesting a miscarriage of justice. They highlighted shortcomings such as the misinterpretation of luminol tests and lack of thorough investigation into the yacht's history. Throughout the unfolding of this intricate and emotionally charged case, one thing remained clear. The conviction of Sue Neil Fraser was not just a legal judgment, but a narrative shaped by a series of contested facts, interpretations, and the relentless pursuit of truth by her advocates.
the daughters of Sunil Fraser arriving at Risdon Prison. This morning isn't one of their regular visits. There's activity behind the fences as Neil Fraser is handed over, leaving prison at long last, but not in the way she wanted. After 13 years behind bars, Eve Ash and Colin McLaren's investigation into Sue Neil Fraser's case took a pivotal turn when they finally located Megan Vass, whose DNA was discovered on the Four Winds yacht. After a decade of silence, Vass decided to reveal her story, drastically altering the narrative of the case. Vass confessed to being on the Four Winds on the night of Bob Chappell's disappearance. She had accompanied her then boyfriend, a 17-year-old known for petty theft from yachts in the bay. That fateful night, they encountered Paul, a hardened criminal with a history of violence and criminal activities. Unbeknownst to them, Bob was aboard the yacht. A confrontation ensued, spiralling into a deadly altercation. During the violent episode, which lasted around 20 minutes, Vass became so distressed that she vomited on the deck, leaving behind the DNA evidence that would later link her to the scene. After witnessing the attack, Vass, terrified, asked her boyfriend to take her ashore. She didn't witness the aftermath, but realised the gravity of the situation when she saw police activity the next morning. Her ex-boyfriend, when confronted with her account, denied any involvement in the incident. In 2019, Sue Neil Fraser lodged a second appeal, anchored in the fresh and compelling testimony provided by Megan Vass, who categorically stated that Sue was not present on the Four Winds that night. However, the prosecution accused Colin McLaren of coercing Vass into altering her story, alleging a payment of $10,000 for her changed testimony, leading to the denial of the appeal. Vass later elaborated on her account in an interview with Australia's 60 Minutes, explaining her long silence as fear for her safety. This interview, alongside her revised affidavit, prompted the reopening of Sue Neil Fraser's case. Sue Neil Fraser's story has drawn parallels with Lindy Chamberlain, whose wrongful conviction for the death of her baby, later attributed to a dingo attack, was one of Australia's most notorious miscarriages of justice. Like Chamberlain, Neil Fraser's case is seen by many as a significant failure of the justice system.